Good evening and welcome to World Review for the Year. 2022 was a year rocked by geopolitical and financial turbulence across the world as Europe faced its first large-scale conflict since World War II. Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February, with tensions between the two nations having been simmering since Ukraine won independence in 1991, and Russia's annexation of the Crimean Peninsula in 2014. The Kiev-Moscow conflict, which is still ongoing, has had a wide-ranging impact globally. Concerns were raised about a Russian invasion of Ukraine from the outset of 2022. Western intelligence services observed a buildup of Russian troops along Ukraine's border. The Kremlin initially insisted its troops were conducting military drills. However, the truth about what was to transpire rapidly became clear. On February 24th, Russian troops launched a wide-ranging attack on Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin asserted the attack was needed to protect Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine from genocide. Putin also claimed that Russia does not intend to occupy Ukraine but will move to demilitarize it. The Russian military has begun a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine. Without provocation, <clears throat> without justification, without necessity, this is a premeditated attack. Airborne troops took control of Antonov International Airport outside Kyiv as Russia set its sights on the Ukrainian capital. However, the Blitzkrieg strategy fell flat in the face of organized Ukrainian resistance. Russian forces fired missiles at several cities. Moscow's defense ministry claimed it was using precision weapons that posed no threat to the civilian population. After declaring martial law, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky urged global leaders to provide defense assistance. The invasion prompted an immediate exodus of people from Ukraine, with many fleeing to bordering countries such as Poland and Romania. Most of those on the move were women, children and the elderly, since Ukraine banned men aged between 18 and 60 from leaving the country. Late February, Zelensky signed an application for Ukraine to join the European Union. The country and neighboring Moldova were granted Canada status in the summer. Meanwhile, Western Allied powers implemented their first round of sanctions on Russia in response to its invasion of Ukraine. Among the measures was an agreement to block certain Russian banks' access to the SWIFT global interbank payment system. With this attempt to seize the Ukrainian capital ultimately capitulating, Russia set its sights on the southeastern coast of Ukraine in a bid to link Russia with the annexed Crimean Peninsula. The vital port city of Mariupol came under siege as the city of Kherson fell. That marked the first significant capture of a city following the start of Russia's invasion. In March, Russian forces took control of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. The plant is the largest such facility in Europe. Russian shelling sparked a fire at the facility, but the UN atomic watchdog said no radioactive material was released. The International Atomic Energy Agency has since expressed concern about the situation at the plant after on-the-ground visits. Days later, the United States banned imports of Russian oil in a major new step in the Western-led effort to hold the invasion of Ukraine. Britain and the European Union announced plans to phase out the use of Russian oil and gas. On March 25th, Russia announced that the first phase of its military operation was almost over and that it will focus on, as it put it, liberating the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. In early April, Ukrainian authorities said the bodies of more than 400 civilians were found in the town of Bucha outside of Kyiv. Officials said many bodies with bound hands had close-range gunshot wounds and signs of torture. The gruesome discovery sparked renewed calls for war crimes investigations. President. In the wake of the allegations, the United Nations General Assembly voted to suspend Russia from its Human Rights Council. On April 8, a missile attack on a train station in the eastern Ukrainian town of Pramatorsk killed more than 50 civilians. This set off the second phase of war as the main battlegrounds between Kyiv and Moscow moved to the south and east of Ukraine. The Kremlin denied carrying out the strike. 
Within a week, Russia said its Black Sea Fleet flagship, the Moskva, sank after an explosion of ammunition, but Ukrainians said they had hit it with missiles. On April 21st, Russian Defense Chief Sergei Shoigu declared Mariupol liberated. This with the exception of Azovstal steel plant, where more than 2,000 Ukrainian fighters and an estimate of 1,000 civilians were said to be holed up. Russia announced further incursions into the east of Ukraine on April 18th, this time vowing to take over Donetsk and Lugansk. On April 28th, Russia fired two missiles at Kyiv during a visit by the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, an attack Ukraine said was an assault on the UN itself. In May, several dozen civilians were evacuated from the Azovstal industrial complex to relative safety. Russian forces subsequently resumed shelling the facility. Finland and Sweden formally applied to join the NATO alliance, a decision spurred by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The countries were both neutral throughout the Cold War. Turkey expressed concerns about the two nations joining the alliance over fears that Sweden had backed the Kurdistan Workers' Party, which is banned in Turkey. Ankara later relented and agreed to allow Sweden and Finland into NATO. On May 20th, Russia's defense ministry said a total of 2,439 Ukrainian fighters who had been holed up at the Azovstal steelworks in Mariupol has surrendered. The complete takeover of Mariupol gave Putin a badly needed victory in the war. Towards the end of June, Russia pulled back its forces from a Black Sea island where they had faced relentless Ukrainian attacks. Moscow said it withdrew its forces from Snake Island as a goodwill gesture. On July 3rd, Ukraine withdrew from Lysychansk in Lugansk, with Russia claiming full control of the eastern region. The battle shifted to Donetsk, where Ukraine still held swathes of territory. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov outlined the need to take the Zaporizhia and Kherson regions, in addition to Donetsk and Lugansk. A breakthrough Turkey brokered deal was achieved in Istanbul on July 22nd. Russia and Ukraine signed separate agreements with Turkey and the United Nations paving the way for the transfer of Ukrainian grain, other produce and fertilizer to international markets under UN supervision. The parties agreed not to carry out attacks against vessels and port facilities engaged in the initiative. Meanwhile, Russian state energy giant Gazprom cut natural gas flows through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline to Germany to a fifth of capacity. On July the 27th, the strategic bridge across the Dnipro River in southern Ukraine's occupied Kherson region, a key supply route for Russian troops, was closed to civilian traffic. As the war entered its third phase marked by more counteroffensives from Kyiv, Ukraine experienced success in Kharkiv, recapturing vast waves of territory including the crucial logistics center Izum. Тем, кто позволяет себе такие заявления в отношении России, хочу напомнить on September 21st, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered Russia's first mobilization since World War II. The mobilization was officially described as a partial one that will steadily draw in 300,000 reservists over a period of months. Many tried to flee Russia after the announcement, as rare anti-war demonstrations broke out across the country. Two days later, the Kremlin kicked off referendums in the four partially occupied territories in eastern Ukraine, namely Donetsk, Lugansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia, on whether they should join Russia. In around a week, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced their annexation. In October, Putin signed a law to incorporate the four partially occupied regions to Russia. With 18 percent of Ukraine's territory seized, it was Europe's biggest annexation since World War II. Four days later, Russian authorities said a truck bomb had caused a fire and the collapse of a section of a bridge linking the annexed Crimean Peninsula with Russia. Russian President Vladimir Putin declared the explosion to be a Ukrainian terrorist attack. Ukraine did not claim responsibility for the blast. In an apparent retaliation, Russia bombed cities across Ukraine during morning rush hour days later, including the capital, Kyiv. This marked the beginning of Russia's winter war strategy, a bombing effort aimed at wiping out Ukraine's infrastructure. Come November, a major Russian retreat. Russia withdrew troops from the occupied Ukrainian city of Kherson and had taken up defensive lines on the opposite bank of the Dnipro River. As fighting is still raging on, Europe also feels a pinch of sanctions on Russia's oil and gas.
The West scrambled for alternative sources, and Russia's threat of retaliation over their oil price cap sent energy prices soaring, possibly leaving more residents in Europe in the cold this winter. Meanwhile, the world's pandemic situation continued to evolve in 2022. The highly transmissible Omicron variant and its offshoots became the dominant strain globally. In Asia, the spread of Omicron prompted the mainland to implement tougher antivirus curbs ahead of the Beijing Winter Olympics. Lockdowns and mass testing were rolled out in major mainland cities. That's before the government announced a new phase in its zero-COVID policy in December. Throughout the year, Hong Kong has been dealing with the fifth wave of the pandemic, and Taiwan reported a sharp increase in daily new infections around the middle of the year. North Korea reported what it claimed as first outbreak of the pandemic, with 350,000 people showing signs of fever. By August, North Korea announced that the outbreak had been largely contained. In March, the Japanese government put Tokyo and 12 other prefectures under a state of emergency, totaling 70 percent of the country. The authorities relented towards the end of the year and eased travel restrictions for foreign tourists. The European Union announced that its pandemic emergency was over, with member states gradually easing restrictions by June. The British government adopted a similar relaxation. The United States dropped COVID testing requirements for international arrivals and largely scrapped domestic curbs. Australia and New Zealand also reopened to fully vaccinated international travelers. Singapore's government announced its intention to lift most restrictions and live with the virus. Thailand also relaxed mask mandates and coronavirus travel restrictions. The World Health Organization estimates at least 90 percent of the world's population now has some level of immunity to COVID-19 due to prior infection or vaccination. But the WHO warned that a troubling new variant could still emerge. Welcome back. For China, 2022 was a year of both renewed international dialogue and escalated geopolitical tensions. With remarkable achievements on Earth and beyond, but also disasters, COVID-related challenges and financial trouble at home. During the 20th Party Congress held in October, President Xi Jinping secured a historic third term as China's leader. That's after Xi spearheaded the abolition of presidential two-term limits on leaders in 2018. The Congress also approved a sweeping reshuffle that saw his closest allies promoted. In his speech, Xi stressed the need for China to stay connected with the world, saying China's development can't leave the world, and the world's development also needs China. In an unexpected move that punctured the Congress closing ceremony, former President Hu Jintao seated next to Xi was escorted out of the hall. State media later explained that's for Hu's health reasons. Before embarking on the five-year term in which Xi is set to face a slew of challenges, the Chinese leader also oversaw multiple achievements through 2022. In February, Beijing made history by being the first to host both the Summer and Winter Olympics. But this also comes as China struggled to turn a page for the showpiece, one that's overshadowed by the pandemic and the U.S.-led diplomatic boycott. Still, the tournament was one to remember for the mainland. China finished third in the overall medal table, with nine golds, four silvers and two bronzes, the country's best result since 1980. Another Chinese feat beyond the realm of the Earth, Shenzhou-15, China's latest manned spacecraft, blasted off in November with three Taikonauts embarking on a half-year-long mission. It is the last of 15 missions since April 2021, including three previous crew missions needed to assemble China's Tiangong space station. Also off the ground in March, an aviation disaster the country mourns in unison. China Eastern Airlines flight MU5375 crashed near the city of Wuzhou in Guangxi. The plane was on its way from Kunming to Guangzhou. All 132 passengers on board the flight were declared dead.
into the third year of the COVID pandemic, government statistics show China had much lower COVID infection and mortality rates than the rest of the world. This as the country continued to impose blitzes of COVID curbs and snapped lockdowns to drive down flare-ups of coronavirus outbreaks. Having endured one of the longest citywide lockdowns in the country was Shanghai. Home to 25 million residents, the once bustling poor city ground to a halt for two months since late March. But with strict COVID restrictions came accounts of chaos and inhumane treatment of residents. They include reports of an elderly home resident being taken to a morgue in a body bag while still alive. An ambulance doctor refused to lend medical equipment to save an asthmatic patient under lockdown. The patient eventually died. The doctor involved was suspended from duties. Numerous accounts of food supply shortages across multiple Shanghai neighborhoods too. All this pent-up frustration encapsulated in this montage of audio complaints named Voices of April as a rare public outcry against strict COVID curbs on residents. The video went viral before it was swiftly taken down from the internet. In November, violent protests erupted at Foxconn's flagship iPhone plant in Zhengzhou as employees complained about working conditions, pay and COVID restrictions. Also in November, as China carried on with a zero-COVID policy, a fire broke out in an apartment building in Rumqi, Xinjiang, leaving 10 people dead and nine others injured. Local authorities denied allegations that rescue efforts had been delayed and residents could not evacuate the building because of epidemic control. The deadly fire sparked a maelstrom of protests the country has never seen under the pandemic. An unusual show of defiance in vigils turned protests erupted across major cities, including universities in Beijing, Nanjing and Shanghai, as well as in nearby Guangzhou, whose daily COVID tally topped 10,000. In late November, a top official said the country's efforts to combat the pandemic were entering a new phase, with the Omicron variant weakening and vaccination rates improving. A number of cities began loosening COVID restrictions. And December saw the country's major pivot from a zero-COVID policy. On the 7th, China unveiled a new 10-point plan under which COVID patients with mild symptoms are allowed to quarantine at home. Just 20 days later, not even home isolation was needed, with an end to large-scale lockdowns as authorities downgraded the coronavirus to a Class B disease and rechristened COVID from the novel coronavirus pneumonia to novel coronavirus infection another major step marking the end of nearly three years of isolation from the rest of the world. International arrivals on the mainland no longer need to be quarantined starting January 8th. But as the National Health Commission scaled back reports of its daily COVID figures amid fewer PCR tests, municipal governments have been reporting tens of thousands of COVID cases every day. While it became more difficult to keep a true count of cases in China, funeral homes looked busier than normal. The pandemic aside, the Taiwan issue remains a sore point for China. In August, the Sino-U.S. relations plunged to a new low when the high-profile visit to Taiwan by U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi magnified tensions. As the highest-ranking U.S. official to visit the island in 25 years, Pelosi described her trip as a show of America's unwavering commitment to supporting Taiwan's democracy. That's amid China's stern warning to take necessary measures to defend its sovereignty. Just one day after her visit, the People's Liberation Army launched military exercise surrounding Taiwan with live fire drills. Taiwan's military forces also conducted exercises in various parts of the island. Come September, President Xi Jinping set foot outside the Chinese territory for the first time since the pandemic began in state visits to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. That also set the stage for a series of international summits and conferences for more international dialogue for China in November. President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden held more than three hours of talks on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Bali, Indonesia. In their first face-to-face -face encounter since Biden assumed office in 2021, Biden told Xi the U.S. would continue to compete with China economically, but that should not lead to conflict. 
The two leaders also agreed that nuclear weapons should never be an option as they discussed Russia's war with Ukraine. Biden was said to have objected to China's coercive and increasingly aggressive actions towards Taiwan, raised human rights concerns about Xinjiang, Tibet and Hong Kong. President Xi Jinping also met on the sidelines with various regional leaders, but as the exchanges behind the spotlight also emerged. Everything we discuss is then leaked to the paper that's not appropriate. In a clip recorded by the media pool at the G20 summit, she was seen rebuking Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau over leaks to the media about China-Canada relations. <laughs> On December 8th, she arrived in Saudi Arabia to attend the first China Arab State Summit and the China Gulf Cooperation Council Summit and pay a state visit to the Saudi Kingdom. The visit came at a time when Riyadh's long-standing alliance with Washington has been strained over human rights issues, energy policy and Russia. Speaking at the China GCC summit, she said China and Gulf nations should make full use of the Shanghai Petroleum and Gas Exchange as a platform to carry out Yuan settlement of oil and gas trade. It's a move that would support Beijing's goal to establish its currency internationally and weaken the U.S. dollar's grip on world trade. All this as the country underwent a slowing economy, with China's GDP forecast to grow by 3.2% in 2022. That's well below the official target of 5.5 percent. Foreign investment leaving China also reached record highs. The Five Eyes nations banded together to bar 5G equipment from China's Huawei and ZTE. Financial troubles from within the country too. Since spring, rural banks in Hunan entered the spotlight after four banks froze deposits worth some 39 billion yuan, involving thousands of customers. Authorities later arrested hundreds of people for alleged ties with the nation's biggest ever bank fraud. A major social policy shift in 2022 too. China started allowing couples to have up to three children after census data showed a steep decline in birth rates. China scrapped its decade-old one-child policy in 2016 and replaced it with a two-child limit, which has failed to result in a sustained upsurge in births. Also, it's game over for minors on weekdays in China. Online gamers under the age of 18 can only play three hours most weekends as part of China's escalation of restrictions on the country's massive gaming industry. In Taiwan, a wave of political changes sweeping across the lower-level governments too. Taiwan leader Tsai Ing-wen resigned as chairwoman of her Democratic Progressive Party after the opposition Kuomintang retook its traditional strongholds in local elections in November. The KMT won back mayoral seats in Taipei, Taoyuan and Keelung, among a string of other victories. One of the winners is Chang Wan An, who will become the new mayor of Taipei. The 43-year-old is the great-grandson of the late KMT leader Chiang Kai-shek. Politics aside, Taiwan has been roiled by natural disasters and power blackouts. In March, a widespread power outage plunged more than 5 million households in the dark. The island south was hit the hardest with citywide power cuts. <laughs> Southeastern Taiwan was rattled by a magnitude 6.8 earthquake, toppling buildings and derailing trains. Leading up to this main quake, the island was rocked by more than 70 tremors, a rare phenomenon according to the local weather agency. <laughs> And as the year comes to an end, the nation's history also turns a page with the passing of a political titan. On November 30th, former Chinese President Jiang Zemin died of leukemia and multiple organ failure at the age of 96. Jiang has served as head of state from 1993 to 2003, during which China saw huge economic and social changes. President Xi Jinping, who is also General Secretary of the Communist Party of China, called Jiang an outstanding leader who laid a solid foundation for China's development. Xi also urged the public to carry forward the legacy of Jiang Zemin. The ashes of the late leader were scattered into the sea at the mouth of the Yangtze River on December 11th. Welcome back again. 2022 saw dramatic changes in governments around the world and a string of influential figures pass away.
Britain experienced a tumultuous year, which saw two changes of prime minister, but also the end of an era for the royal family. Then Prime Minister Boris Johnson found himself in hot water after being linked to a string of scandals related to the flouting of pandemic lockdown rules in 2020 and 2021. This triggered a flurry of high-profile resignations from within his cabinet that culminated in Johnson stepping down in July and a Conservative Party leadership race. Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to thank everybody here and hasta la vista, baby. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Former Chancellor of the Exchequer Rishi Sunak and Foreign Minister Liz Truss emerged as the final two candidates in the race. Truss came out on top in a postal ballot among Conservative Party members and was appointed as British Prime Minister by Queen Elizabeth II on September 6 at the Monarch's Balmoral Estate in Scotland. However, little did Truss know she had taken office just before the end of a royal era. Her Majesty the Queen's. Just two days after appointing the new Prime Minister, Queen Elizabeth II passed away at the age of 96 at her Balmoral estate in Scotland. The news of the Queen's passing prompted outpourings of grief as well as tributes globally. In London, King Charles III was officially proclaimed Britain's monarch in a ceremony steeped in tradition. On September 19th, Queen Elizabeth II's state funeral took place at London's Westminster Abbey. The Queen's funeral was the first state funeral held in the UK since that of Winston Churchill in 1965. After the Queen's state funeral and a final procession through the British capital, the Queen's coffin was taken to Windsor Castle by a hearse. Her late husband, Prince Philip, died last year at the age of 99. Queen Elizabeth II will go down in history as Britain's longest serving monarch. In June 2022, she celebrated her platinum jubilee, marking 70 years on the throne. Back on the political front, Liz Truss' time in number 10 Downing Street fizzled out as soon as it began. Her downfall was sparked by her and Chancellor of the Exchequer Kwasi Kwarteng's so-called mini-budget, which was reviewed on September 23rd. The measures, which included tax cuts for the UK's highest earners, sparked chaos in financial markets and caused the pound to plummet. Truss eventually resigned as Prime Minister on October 20th, after just 45 tumultuous days, becoming Britain's shortest-serving leader in the process. That sparked a week-long Conservative Party leadership contest, which was won by former Chancellor of the Exchequer Rishi Sunak, who had lost out to trust in the summer ballot. He was appointed by King Charles III at Buckingham Palace on October 25th. Sunak is the UK's first Prime Minister of colour and first Hindu leader. I want to pay tribute to my predecessor, Liz Truss. She was not wrong to want to improve growth in this country. It is a noble aim. And I admired her restlessness to create change. But some mistakes were made. Not born of ill will or bad intentions. Quite the opposite, in fact but mistakes nonetheless. And I have been elected as leader of my party and your Prime Minister 
in part, to fix them. And that work begins immediately. On August 30th, one of the most controversial and important leaders of the 20th century, the last general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, died at the age of 91 after a long illness. He was buried in Moscow's Novodevichy Cemetery next to his wife. Gorbachev was best known for implementing policies named Glasnost and Perestroika, Russian for openness and restructuring respectively. This entailed encouraging entrepreneurship, reducing the government's role in the economy, and greater government transparency. On the foreign policy front, Gorbachev sought to ease tensions with the United States, with whom the USSR had been locked in a nuclear arms race since the end of World War II. Gorbachev also put Soviet troops out of Afghanistan between 1988 and 1989. These efforts saw Gorbachev awarded the 1990 Nobel Peace Prize. Still, the ultimate failure of perestroika to rejuvenate the Soviet economy led to an attempted coup in 1991. This undermined the central government, triggering a series of events that led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union later that year. Former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who was his country's longest-serving leader, was assassinated on July 8 while on the campaign trail for the ruling Liberal Democratic Party. While in the midst of a speech in the city of Nara, a gunman caught the former leader and crowd off guard by opening fire from behind. Abe was later pronounced dead after suffering major damage to his heart and two bullet wounds to his neck. The alleged assassin, a former member of Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force, reportedly told police he killed a politician because of his links to the ultra-conservative Unification Church. Abe's state funeral was held in Tokyo on September 27, amid controversy over the cause of the ceremony. In Italy, the right-wing Brothers of Italy party claimed the most votes in the country's parliamentary election. Its leader, Giorgia Maloney, became Italy's first woman prime minister with the help of her right-wing and center-right allies. Maloney played down her Brothers of Italy party's neo-fascist roots. She pledged to back Western policy on Ukraine and stabilize Italy's fragile economy. <laughs> Emmanuel Macron became the first French president to secure a second consecutive term in office since Jacques Chirac in 2002. Macron defeated right-wing challenger Marine Le Pen in the country's general election in April. However, Macron's La République en Marche party lost ground in the June elections and hence its grasp on majority in France's National Assembly. This means that it will be harder for Macron to implement his desired policies over the course of his second term. Sri Lanka saw political upheaval as the country's crippling inflation and high levels of borrowing were compounded by the pandemic's ravaging effect on the crucial tourism sector. This led to Sri Lanka's first ever sovereign default on its foreign debt as basic supplies such as food and fuel became increasingly scarce. In response, demonstrations broke out and reached their zenith when protesters stormed the official Colombo residence of President Gautabaya Rajapaksa in early July. Rajapaksa subsequently fled to Singapore via the Maldives before resigning later that month. Former Prime Minister Ranil Rikram Singhe was later chosen by members of Sri Lanka's parliament to succeed Rajapaksa. In South Korea, Yoon suk yeols People Power Party won the country's presidential election in March. On the foreign policy front, Yoon vowed to take a more hawkish stance towards China and North Korea while boosting ties with the United States. Domestically, he pledged to focus on stimulating growth in the private sector with the hope of rejuvenating a stagnating economy. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. became the new president of the Philippines after cruising to victory in the country's May general election. The former senator fought off competition from the likes of boxing legend Manny Pacquiao, campaigning on the platform of post-COVID economic rejuvenation and plans to improve infrastructure. He succeeds Rodrigo Duterte, whose legacy includes brutal crackdowns on alleged drug gang members. On foreign affairs, Marcos Jr. outlined his desire to engage with China. The election win marked a return to power for the prominent and controversial Marcos political family. In Brazil, leftist leader Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva narrowly defeated the incumbent right-wing president Jair Bolsonaro in the November runoff election. It marked a stunning comeback for the former president, whose terms in office between 2003 and 2010 coincided with a commodity-driven economic boom that helped lift millions out of poverty. 
Luda was convicted in 2017 and sentenced to nine and a half years in prison after being put on trial in the wake of a graft probe. Luda was eventually released following 19 months behind bars after Brazil's Supreme Court annulled his convictions because of improper jurisdiction. He garnered support after his release by vowing to tackle poverty and combat deforestation in Brazil's Amazon rainforest. His inauguration is scheduled to take place on January 1st. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan was ousted from office in May by a no-confidence vote from his political opponents. Khan accused the opposition of colluding with the U.S. to remove him from office over concerns about his foreign policy, which saw Pakistan strengthen its ties with China and Russia. Shabazz Sharif, the head of one of the country's largest parties, the Pakistani Muslim League, succeeded Khan as prime minister. Khan could seek to return to power in 2023 elections despite being injured during what he called an assassination attempt in November. Australia's Labour Party won the country's federal election in May. Labour Party leader Anthony Albanese subsequently replaced the Liberal Party's Scott Morrison as prime minister. Labour has promised to implement a more comprehensive social welfare program, raise the national minimum wage and target net zero emissions by 2050. Anwar Ibrahim became Malaysia's 10th prime minister, completing a roller coaster journey that lasted almost 25 years, which included a jail term he called politically motivated. The 75 year old was picked to lead the country by Malaysia's King Al Sultan Abdullah after none of the major parties was able to secure a parliamentary majority in Malaysia's general election. In Israel, former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made a comeback after his Likud party, along with religious Zionism and a pair of ultra-Orthodox religious parties, captured a 64-seat majority in the country's November legislative election. Religious Zionism has promised to push through new reforms that could weaken Israel's judicial branch and grant Netanyahu immunity amid corruption allegations. Welcome back to the last part of World Review 2022. Many countries around the world also experienced political drama, most notably the U.S. where the Democrats and Republicans remain divided over economic, social and geopolitical policies. 2022 also saw unprecedented heat waves in Europe and parts of Asia, stoking fears that world leaders are not doing enough to combat climate change. Asia bore witness to several tragedies, including a bridge collapse in India and a Halloween crush in Seoul. On June 24, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the 1973 Roe v. Wade law. The move essentially ended 50 years of constitution protection for abortion in the U.S. States now have the legal power to ban abortions. The best day of American history in my lifetime. In the wake of the ruling, pro-choice protests erupted nationwide in cities including New York, Los Angeles and San Francisco. U.S. President Joe Biden said the decision made his country a laughing stock in the developed world and made the Supreme Court look extreme. In 2022, the U.S. continued to be rocked by a string of gun violence, with two proving particularly devastating. On May 14th, a shooting at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York, left 10 people dead. Peyton Gendron, an 18-year-old white gunman dressed in body armor, opened fire with a rifle and live-streamed the attack on a gaming platform. Out of the 13 victims, 11 were African Americans, while two were white. Gendron now faces first-degree murder and hate crime charges. On May 25th, another 18-year-old gunman identified as Salvador Ramos opened fire at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, killing at least 19 children and two adults. It marked the deadliest school shooting in the United States since the tragedy at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newton, Connecticut in 2012. In November, the U.S. midterm elections got underway, with U.S. President Joe Biden seemingly under pressure amid soaring inflation and rising crime levels. Contrary to analysts' predictions, overwhelming vote margins for Republican candidates or the so-called red wave didn't quite materialize, although there were some notable Republican victories, including the re-election of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis for a second term. Democrats fared better than expected. The Democrats will keep control of the U.S. Senate, which will allow the party to approve Biden nominees such as federal judges. 
However, the Republicans won a majority in the U.S. House of Representatives, setting the stage for two years of divided government. Underlying all this is the 2024 presidential race, which will see the return of former President Donald Trump, who announced he will make another bid for the White House. In 2020, I received the largest number of votes of any sitting president in history by a lot. And we will do it again, but with even more votes this time. It remains to be seen whether Trump can recapture the popularity that saw him win the presidency in 2016. Trump faces huge challenges on multiple fronts, including civil and criminal investigations. In August, Trump became the subject of a federal criminal probe into a trove of top-secret documents he was keeping in his Florida home. A congressional inquiry about the lead-up to the January 6 Capitol riot in 2021 by his supporters after his presidential election defeat in 2021 has also damaged his standing. To the other end of the world in India, at least 141 people died in the town of Morbi in the Indian state of Gujarat in October after a century-old cable suspension bridge collapsed into the Machu River. Officials said the bridge was unable to bear the weight of hundreds of revelers celebrating the Hindu festival season. Built by the British in 1877, the bridge was considered an engineering marvel for its time. After six months of repairs, it only reopened days before its collapse. Most of the victims were teens, women and elderly people. Gujarat police have registered a criminal case against those responsible for the renovation, maintenance and management of the bridge. In Malang, East Java of Indonesia, this stadium stampede in October marked one of the world's deadliest disasters ever at a sporting event. Panicking spectators tried to escape the overpacked stadium after police fired tear gas to disperse fans from the losing home side, who ran onto the pitch at the end of the soccer match. Officials say the government will form an independent fact-finding team comprising academics and soccer experts to probe the deadly crush that killed 125 people, including 17 children. The tragedy is set to damage Indonesia's bid to host a 2023 Asian Cup. It is vying with South Korea and Qatar to become hosts of the Continental Championship after China relinquished its rights in May. The same month in South Korea, a similar tragedy struck as the country celebrated its first unrestricted Halloween festivities in three years. The crush killed some 153 people and injured more than 80 others as revelers flocked to Seoul's popular Itaewon district on Saturday, October 29th. Reports estimate more than 100,000 people were in the neighborhood at the time. Itaewon's steep, narrow streets could not cope with the large number of revelers leading to the disaster. South Korea's President Yoon suk yeol visited the site on the day after the tragedy and declared a period of national mourning. <laughs> this as tensions continue to run high on the Korean peninsula. In October, North Korea conducted its longest ever weapons test. As part of the exercise, a nuclear-capable ballistic missile was flown over Japan, prompting the Japanese government to issue evacuation alerts and bring train services to a halt. Analysts believe Pyongyang is seeking to demonstrate the strength of its military arsenal in a bid to gain diplomatic concessions from the U.S. and its allies. North Korea has launched dozens of ballistic missiles this year. In October, a court in military ruled Myanmar convicted the country's ousted leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, on two more corruption charges. Her supporters say the charges are politically motivated and aimed at preventing her from taking part in the next election that the military has promised to hold in 2023. Scientists warned of the threat posed by climate change as Europe saw an unprecedented heat wave over the summer. On July 19th, Britain recorded its highest ever temperature, 40.3 degrees Celsius. The extreme conditions disrupted travel, health care and schools across the nation. In continental Europe, wildfires tore through parts of France, Spain, Portugal, Italy and Greece. Floodwaters damaged India and Pakistan, affecting more than 33 million people. Record monsoon rain and melting glaciers in northern mountains sparked intense deluges. 
Pakistan received almost 190% more rain than its 30-year average in the quarter from June to August, totaling more than 390 millimeters. Pakistan's government has blamed the extreme weather on climate change. Delegates at the United Nations COP27 Climate Summit in Egypt officially approved a deal on a fund for developing countries vulnerable to climate change made worse by polluting developed nations. The loss and damage fund would have to be paid for by developed nations. A transitional committee will make recommendations for countries to adopt at COP28. This came after UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned of the danger climate change posed for humanity. We are in the fight of our lives and we are losing. Greenhouse gas emissions keep growing. Global temperatures keep rising. And our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. Still, there may be some light at the end of the tunnel as U.S. scientists revealed a breakthrough on fusion energy that could one day help curb climate change. In December, the U.S. Energy Department said scientists at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California for the first time briefly achieved a net energy gain in a nuclear fusion experiment using lasers. The scientists focused a laser on a target of fuel to fuse two light atoms into a denser one, releasing the energy. Scientists have known for about a century that fusion powers the sun and have pursued developing fusion on Earth for decades. The experiment briefly achieved was known as fusion ignition by generating 3.15 megajoules of energy output after the laser delivered 2.05 megajoules to the target. Scientists heralded the breakthrough as the end result could lead to an era of cleaner and cheaper energy. A cause for celebration, but not complacency. Scientists also warned that it's not a magic bullet to reverse the climate issues, because advances in technology are needed before fusion becomes commercially viable.